OK. We'll try as much on our side to uh, lull you into sleep. So um, this talk is about, uh, quote unquote, a multicolored yarn, how we are evolving yarn to uh, solve a you know, whole bunch of new use cases. I'm, I'm Vinod. Um, quick intro of me and the team uh, who's going to be presenting stuff here. Um, I'm, I've been contributing to Apache Hadoop for close to nine years now, uh, only Hadoop. Um, finally, you know, uh, there, there have been a lot of adverts talking about 10 years uh, Hadoop experience. So till this moment, all of those adverts are kind of uh, invalid. Uh, but even now, there's a very small number of people who have that, uh, who fit that bill. So uh, you should still be careful this year. Maybe from next year on, uh, this will become a little desensitized. <laughs> um, my, I guess my chief contribution is I've uh, helped rewrite the Hadoop processing part of the uh, platform. That, that's what actually has become uh, Yarn. With me, uh, we're going to get uh, Billy Rinali. She's been uh, contributing to Accumulo a lot. Uh, she's also on Slider PMC and ASF member. We also have Jayush on uh, Ambari PMC and uh, Vadim, uh, who's been the kick-ass field guy in my, uh, in my words. <laughs> So uh, the three of these guys, they're, they're going to come later, uh, show you something real. So I'm, I'm going to be talking only for the first 10 minutes. So I, I, I'd rather show you stuff instead of uh, me, again, uh, helping you sleep through the rest of the session. So uh, kicking things off, uh, let's take a quick look at what, uh, how Hadoop, the compute platform, looks. Right? Um, we have a bunch of layers which help applications and frameworks uh, run on top of uh, a shared cluster. It's all about data. We're, you know, uh, the fundamental focus of Yarn and it's the chief thing that it differentiate it. It's differentiated from the rest of the resource managers that you may you may see out is the fact that it's data first, right? We we enable data applications. Of course, the uh, the limitation uh, today is that it's a single color in Yarn, and what I really mean by that is we can run uh, short running jobs, you know, interactive queries and the like very well on top of Yarn today, right? Uh, again, the goal of this talk is to show how we are extending this to uh, a lo you know, lot more colorful world where you can run a bunch of different things. Right? Um, that's, on, that's from the Yarn side going beyond uh, you know, operators manager clusters using either their own tools or things like Apache and Valley. Right? Now, in a nutshell, if you look at the, the way uh, things look in a cluster, so you have a shared platform. Of course, Yarn works you know, together with HDFS. You have shared storage. Uh, Yarn takes care of the resource management uh, aspects. You have operator tools which take care of management, monitoring, alerting, and, and so on. Some of the newer uh, tech, you know, take care of the cluster level security, governance, and the like. Right. And on top of this platform, the higher order layers like MapReduce, Thay, Spark, and you know, stream processing, they enable all these different use cases uh, about batch processing, interactive querying, stream processing, and so on. Right. What's incomplete about this picture is, uh, yes, we are actually running all of these use cases in a single, you can run them in a single uh, multi-tenant secure uh, Hadoop cluster. Obviously, the ecosystem itself is, is growing today. So you, you got more and more newer frameworks coming, and you've got Flink, you've got uh, 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 Kafka, there are a whole bunch of these newer frameworks, which are, again, uh, focusing on uh, very vertical uh, use cases. So we will continue to do that. So it's an ongoing ongoing journey to you know run all sorts of these different workloads on the shared cluster. Um, but what we have seen over time is adding new stuff to this platform has been a bit of an involved effort, and we aim to uh, address that. Right. That that's on one side. Why we are doing what we're doing. Right. The other thing that has happened over time is is the fact that the user focus itself has evolved. Right. Uh, the, by, by the last count, we have about 20, 26, 27 uh, components in the Hadoop ecosystem. Um, but the business users, the users actually want to focus on their end-to-end -end use case. So think of Apache Metron, right? This is a new project in ASF, focused primarily on uh, you know, enabling an analysis of uh, security-related data, right? At this point, you do not care about uh, what is the underlying technology, how am I going to run this, how am I going to bring it up, scale it, all you really focus on is, you know, there is a black box up there. Somebody built this black box, and all I'm, I'm going to be interested in is how to derive value out of this. Right? Uh, we need to move to a place where the focus is on deriving value and not on, you know, uh, bringing the nuts and bolts together. Right? So that's one example. The other example is you can imagine uh, a whole bunch of IoT applications that people are building. Again, they look similar. They, 
you know, out of these 26, 27 components, they pull together a few things that do their individual, uh, you know, perform their individual areas well, put them all together and create an app, right? So the common theme here is, is a need for reusable and composable uh, components. So that, you know, in the morning I was using this uh, analogy, right? So if you want to build a computer today, you don't start from transistors and diodes. You instead, you know, pick your drive specification, CPU, memory, and, and just pull them together and kind of create a new spec, right? That's where we want to go, right? So we have a rock solid base of fundamental building blocks. You put them together. If you put it in one fashion, it'll become Metron. If, it, you, if you put it in a different fashion, it'll become IoT, right? That's what we want to go. And, and the general name that we've been internally calling, and this first time we were talking uh, about public, we call it an assembly. Again, uh, it, it's, it's, it's a bit cliched, kind of like an assembly line where you pull in all the automobile parts and, and, and make a vehicle. Uh, that, that, that's where this comes from. And, and to enable a use case like this, what we really need is uh, a simple way to deploy this assembly uh, end to end so that you don't actually say bring Spark separately, you know, uh, bring Hive server separately and uh, HBase or Kafka and so on. Instead, you look at this entire unit as, as, as a fundamental deployment block and bring it all together, right? And there are a couple of challenges there. One, um, because they're all different disparate units, they need to be able to dynamically discover each other, right? Where is Spark running? Where is HPS running? How do they talk to, talk to each other? Where do I put the data? Do I have directories ready on HDFS by the time this application comes up? So, this, so these are some of the challenges that you have to look at. The, one of the more complex use problems is, uh, you know, uh, this happens in a lot of Hadoop clusters today. So uh, there is an upfront, upfront capacity planning on how many machines do I, uh, you actually need for each of these individual things. This is how much processing I need. This is how much storage I need. And that's how you work backwards and uh, come up with a hardware layout, network layout, and the amount of resources, right? Uh, the, the more applications you add, the more cumbersome this, uh, this exercise becomes, right? So imagine, the, imagine that, you know, 20 users or 20 different organizations have their, their own requirements, their own scalability needs. Uh, automatically figuring out how, how much more resources you need for, for the next 12 months is a very challenging exercise, right? And, and, and the more workloads you add, the, the worse it becomes. So that is one area we need to uh, solve. So on top of this, the, the other interesting bits are how do you manage this, you know, entire unit uh, monitor this entire unit. Again, at, at the Metron level, what you really want to see is how is the overall health of my assembly? I, I, I don't care if, if, if I lose two nodes or if I have lost two Kafka brokers. What I really want to make sure is that the entire unit is up and serving its purpose, right? And if, if you uh, look a little carefully, you can actually do interesting things. One of the uh, very exciting things that we are looking at right now is what if I can say, you know, suddenly I have gotten no, more load into this, uh, into this business application. You automatically figure out how many more nodes you want uh, how, and how does, this, how does that translate to how much more storage, how much more processing, how much more, uh, you, know, uh, you know, individual services need different resources for each of them. So if all of that can be automatically translated, that will be an awesome thing, right? So one, one question you could ask is, why should I do all of this on top of Yarn or in a dynamic system like this, right? Um, one is, of course, uh, if I had been successful so far, you can understand that the manual plumbing of all these different pieces is, is a very tiresome effort. Um, bringing individual apps itself is a tiresome effort, but once you bring whole assemblies and different versions of assemblies, uh, it becomes, uh, you know, that much more, it, it becomes that much more difficult. So that's on, that, that's on how you deploy stuff, right? But uh, on the capacity planning itself, you could ask, why, why, not, why don't I statically allocate it two machines for uh, Spark, you know, three machines for Kafka, five machines for HPS? Why don't I do it? Uh, obviously, you know, if you have run a large enough cluster, you would know that machines die all the time. So keeping all of these disparate pieces up and running is going to be a nightmare. The good thing is, at least the frameworks that we have so far, like MapReduce, Jaw, you know, um, uh, Hive, Tails, uh, Spark, they're all fault tolerant in some, so, so that's okay. But once you add services into the mix, handling faults, you know, uh, is going to be a nightmare. So if you start treating each of these individual services as, um, you know, for the lack of a better word, privileged children, you, you'd just be spoiling them, right? We talked about cap upfront capacity planning, uh, what happens if hardware or utilization uh, changes? How do you react to uh, 
uh, such a change fast. You, you cannot do that in, in a static allocation. The thing is, these are the same set of problems that we originally set out to solve when we started YARN, right? So why don't we use YARN? That, that, that's the answer, right? Now, there are more challenges. Uh, it, it's been very good that the Hadoop ecosystem has been focusing on data very well, and we think we know data best. But the big data use cases don't necessarily stop at, the end, at Hadoop, right? So to, and one example is you've already done your analysis uh, in Hive or Spark, or what you will. Uh, but you know, the outcome of all your big data experiment is a very small data set you want to you know, serve uh, uh, in real time. Right? So, and, and we have tools. You, know, you can imagine traditional databases. There are new uh, graphing and analytic dashboards like Zeppelin. So you want to just dump this small output and you know, keep interacting with it. Right? So if you look at it that way, big data use cases don't necessarily stop at Hadoop services. You would also need these other things that have existed for a long time before big data. Right? And the, the, but the interesting bit is the users don't care about the separation. The users, as I've been saying, they focus on the end-to-end -end use case. Whether it's big data, non-big data, you know, scalable, non-scalable, these are the labels that they really don't care about. If you look at all of this, uh, we'll come up with a picture like this, which is instead of a monochromatic yarn like before, we'll have a much more colorful yarn, um, which, which supports a lots of different use cases, which, is, which represent the different colors. Uh, obviously, we want to be able to uh, do today's, you know, perform today's applications much better. We're going to talk about uh, a, a bit of that. We want to support long-running services, applications, and assemblies. Excuse me. The other thing that we want to solve is, uh, Clearly, if you're interacting with the SQL layer, you would, you know, SQL would be abstracting all of Hadoop to you. But uh, those of you who had to go, you know, to the lower levels, you would have seen that the Hadoop ecosystem is a little bit hard in terms of bringing your app to your cluster the, from the moment you write your first line of code all the way to deployment. So we have been doing a bunch of things to enable bring, bringing your uh, new apps easily. So that's the uh, context. So now we can we can jump into what's happening right now. And you know, with, with it, we can f look at some of the uh, newer tech that, uh, that's been in progress. So I'll, I'll, I'll discuss the packaging uh, after that with, for APIs and, uh, um, and the framework. So Billy, uh, if you can come here and set up in the meanwhile, that'll be great. So first up, bringing your new apps easily, right? So for those of you who have been to that other conference uh, up north a couple of weeks ago, uh, you would have seen that uh, containers are, are, have taken the industry by storm, right? So you can see it here. Uh, so essentially, containers are lightweight mechanisms for both packaging your application and also as, as a means of uh, resource uh, isolation. Uh, clearly, it, Docker is not the only containerization format, but it, it is what has made containers very accessible. What we have seen is uh, both in, in the Hadoop space and outside of Hadoop space, a lot of people have used VMs in places where they really didn't need to, um, and, and Docker is really uh, filling that need, right? So to, to this end, uh, the Yarn community has been working on a native integration of uh, Docker containers in Yarn. What it really means is if you have a build, if you built a Docker image outside of uh, the Hadoop ecosystem, you could bring it to Yarn and simply run it by writing a very small spec file. Like that, that's, that's the power we want to bring you. In addition to running all of these big data applications, if you, uh, if you have your own, let's say, a Spark image of version X, you know, uh, uh, two point something, right? Everybody can bring their own image. Everybody can have their own version of the software. You could just run all of them on the same uh, YARN cluster. What it really means is you inherit the you know, uh, multi-tenancy model, security model, uh, the queue policies, all of that, that you know, the big data uh, side of things have already gotten used to, you, you simply inherit them, right? Um, in the demo, we, we, can, we can actually show you uh, some of these containers, how we interact, and so on. At, at the, you know, if you go, go underneath, what we've really done is, uh, Jan has always had a notion of containers even before the Docker containers uh, revolution. Uh, for us, it was always a simple process, a group of processes or process trees. So now we have the notion of a container runtime, and what we had before became the process runtime, right? Uh, so in addition to process runtime, we have a Docker runtime. You can imagine more runtimes as more uh, formats come into picture. 
With that, I would like to transfer this over to Billy for a discussion on APIs and what's happening. Moving a couple of containers here and there, so please bear with us. <laughs> Bad container joke. Clearly, nobody got it. <laughs> All right. Hey, can you guys hear me? Okay, so uh, I'm going to be talking about some of the things that are going on behind the scenes to make assemblies work. Um, uh, Apache Slider has been in the Apache incubator since 2014. Uh, and its goal has been to make it easier to run long-running services on Yarn. Uh, in the past, to run applications on Slider, you had to give it a zip archive containing your application tarball, your configuration files, and some Python scripts. Uh, but with the advent of Docker uh, and the work we've done in Slider 906 and Yarn 3611, uh, which is the runtime ticket that Vinod was talking about. Um, now you can give Slider a Docker image instead of this zip archive. That really makes packaging your application much easier uh, for running on Yarn. And that's sort of led into our work in Yarn 4692, uh, which is an umbrella for simplifying running services on Yarn. Uh, one of the important pieces of this is a REST API for launching your applications. And Yarn 47.93 has a REST API specification uh, for creating, deleting, and obtaining information about your applications. On the slider side, we're adding support for assemblies in slider 8.75. Uh, and what that really means is that you're able to build up more complex applications by using existing application specifications as building blocks. If we go into our assemblies view and take a look at this log search assembly, we can view its spec file. And we can see this log search assembly is actually made up of three different applications, a zookeeper application, a solar application, and a UI application. When we took a, take a look at the Yarn app master for this log search assembly, we can see that spec file resulted in us having three Zookeeper containers, two solar containers, and one UI container. Another important piece of the puzzle is discovery of services via DNS. And what that's going to allow us to do is to have a unique host name for each one of these containers in our application. Uh, actually, each container is going to have more than one host name. Uh, one of the host names is going to be based on the container ID, so it'll be unique per container. And then there'll also be a well-known host name, which is based on this component name. So the reason we have this well-known host name is if one of these containers goes down and comes back up, it's going to have a new container ID. So the unique host name will be different, but this well-known host name will be the same. Uh, so we can go into the, the solar UI for this log search assembly, and uh, the URL for that is always going to be the same. So you can see it starts with the component name, solar stable, solar one followed by the app name, log search stable, followed by the user, and then the domain name. This isn't just useful on the user side uh, for like always having a cons consistent URL you can hit. It's also extremely helpful when you're configuring your application. If we go back to this application spec, we can see that the solar app was configured uh, by uh, given these well-known Zookeeper host names, and also the UI part of the application was given both the Zookeeper host names and one of the Solar host names. We can take a look in one of these Docker containers. 
For example, this uh, Solar 2 container on CN08. And we can see that this container is running our Y Cloud Solar image. Uh, we can exec into that container and see that it's run, running our solar process. Uh, we could take a look at the logs or run other uh, commands in this container if we wanted. And I'm also going to show that the host name, uh, in this case, uh, this is the container ID based host name. You can see it's the uh, container number seven for application 139, which is our log search application. So, uh, in summary, all of these new features taken together are really greatly improving our ability to run uh, services and assemblies on Yarn. And uh, a little bit later, we're going to get in uh, get into an even more complex example of a credit fraud application. Thank you. All right, this needs to support. Okay. Um, so, so that's how you actually, uh, you have seen an example of a, an application, how it is built using other components. You, you've also seen how uh, it, it's actually running on top of Yarn and in containers. Uh, some of the other bits that we have done is, as you can see here, uh, we've also changed Ambari to uh, essentially um, show both services that Ambari itself has installed on bare metal, as well as uh, applications and services that are running on top of Yarn. Um, so I've got uh, Jayush now who can explain some of the changes that went in there and how uh, both Ambari as well as other admin tools that you, you know, people might have uh, can integrate into Yarn-based uh, services and assemblies. Yeah, you can, you can continue from there. Thanks, Vinod. Hello. Hello. Yeah. yeah. Uh, thanks, Vinod. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, so as, as Vinod already mentioned uh, uh, that uh, Ambari makes, uh, does a good job of uh, providing a good experience with uh, managing uh, native services. Uh, so if you can see, basically you can deploy and monitor uh, so, uh, native services very easily. However, there hasn't been a first class support for YARN hosted services, uh, which um, based on the um, uh, improvements that are going in the yarn uh, dr driven by the yarn team I think we have a very good opportunity to bring a more sophisticated end user experience by giving a first uh, first class experience for yarn hosted services and assemblies as such and today uh, I would uh, like to uh, uh, showcase a working prototype of uh, this integration work that we have been working on uh, and um, uh, basically work through um, the details over here as such. Um, so uh, to begin with, I would like to introduce the notion of an assembly store uh, where um, basically it's, it's a one-stop shop for assemblies and services. And um, basically um, a, a, a developer or vendor can uh, implement their own assemblies and publish to the assembly store and the end user can actually uh, configure and deploy these assemblies as such. So uh, as you can see um, in, the, uh, in the assembly store, you can have multiple assemblies. Um, like uh, for example, we have the credit fraud detection assembly, log search assembly, metron assembly, and so on and so forth. When you click on it, basically you'll get additional information about what this assembly does, what are the services which are included in, this, in, in the assembly as such. Um, further, like if you really want to deploy, uh, if you go through the deployment process, instead of working at a, operating at a very uh, low level uh, uh, where you can actually configure each service, etc., we are giving an opportunity for you to actually specify what is the business use case or what, what are the uh, business requirements. And that's what uh, we are actually making it much more easier to configure assemblies, uh, giving an experience where, uh, as an example here, uh, for log search, you can actually specify how many log events per second you, do you expect to have. Uh, to, to, to have and based on that basically uh, the internal details are more like uh, based on these patterns uh, these requirements uh, the, ne the necessary uh, configuration will be applied as such um, so once you have an assembly deployed 
Uh, as you can see, there are multiple assemblies already deployed in this cluster. Uh, here, what we are giving is a first class uh, experience for assemblies and services, uh, which is uh, something which we have been thinking about. But uh, given all these changes, actually, it just makes more sense to uh, start uh, moving towards that direction as such. Um, so once you click on an, on an assembly, you, you will actually be directed to a dashboard for uh, that assembly. And you can, see, you can see that you can actually navigate between the services, uh, look at the uh, health of each of the components within the service. Um, you can actually also have uh, service uh, or assembly level actions where you can stop all services, start all services, and so on and so forth. Um, the other requirement would be, be uh, like you want to reconfigure or you want to scale up or scale down your, your requirements. You can go to the settings tab and uh, reconfigure and re, uh, uh, restart your services as such, or restart your assembly as a, as a single deployment unit. Um, the other thing which we have is like, uh, just like all other services in Ambari, there, there are quick links. And uh, these quick links can also be, uh, nav uh, helps with navigation. For example, uh, for log search, we have a log search UI, which like you can actually get into. And if you see, this is actually a DNS entry uh, that we are actually uh, going to based on uh, where the uh, log search UI is actually hosted as such. Um, <coughs> Sorry, uh, it flipped over. And uh, the other thing you can see is what was the specification that I had specified uh, for deploying the assembly itself. Uh, so this is a JSON object as such. You, you can go through it as such. Uh, and if you really are interested, you can go into the nitty gritty details. Uh, for example, here you can see what are the containers, what are the uh, different um, properties of these containers and so on and so forth. So we, we are kind of giving all the f uh, advanced f uh, functionality as well. The other aspect uh, here is about uh, metrics. Basically, we, you can actually also create Grafana dashboards as an example for that assembly. Uh, to give, a, give you an example of here, that I have a Grafana dashboard for credit for. And uh, you can see, like, you can actually see the overall metrics for uh, metrics for those uh, for that assembly as such. Um, so yeah, as as you can see, overall, uh, Ambari and Yarn together can stitch the fabric based on the specification that you specify and build the fabric just for you as such. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Josh. So we have seen how uh, you can build the application. You have also seen how you know management uh, and operations can can be taken care of. So now let's let's change the viewpoint and see how the guy who's actually built the application and how he's running on the cluster. Uh, so Vadim, can you um, do a five minute demo of that? Um, so this is actually. Just as an aside, I just think this is such an exciting development in this space because there was a time when you needed a PhD to do anything <laughs> with Hadoop, right? And it's getting to the point now where um, it's becoming easy to use and becoming a true platform, not just for data processing, but you know, it can run your application. So the more you can leverage your investment, the better. And I, think, I just think this is where it gets us. It just makes it accessible and further democratizes data. So without further ado, let's just take a look in a little bit more depth of what it looks like to get an actual, like an application that addresses a vertical solution, right? For in this case, the financial vertical. So under the assemblies here, you can see there's this application, right? But how did we actually get to this point? So ultimately what will happen is you're just gonna be able to you go through an interview process and um, uh, select the components you want and fill out how they wire together and all this kind of stuff. At the moment, those pieces are not yet connected together. So what it comes down to is, is that process would basically generate a, um, uh, a, a JSON descriptor that looks just like this. Now, what we have here is you can see there is a a block, which is defined as an application type, which gets to, these are like the zookeeper servers. 
Um, then next we have some custom components, which are actually custom Docker types. Like if you notice, um, So if you notice, right, like you don't recognize that icon, and that's because those are the actual UI, um, the can Docker containers that contain runnable jars, which are, they're just Tomcat, right? That's where the UI lives. So we were able to add a custom component, put it into the image repository, um, and then refer to it in the JSON descriptor, which then told, a, told um, Yarn to create an instance of that, right? Something that it was never really part of Hadoop at all. So we have those two components. Then we have like Apache NiFi in here. We have a Kafka broker. Um, we have a Storm, and uh, these are actually the same type of container, but we are able to issue different launch commands for them so that we can start up an instance, even though we have the same container type, we create a supervisor and a Nimbus, right, from the same container issuing different commands at, at launch time. Um, you also notice that when I'm creating Zookeeper, this, this kind of goes beyond the Docker capability of um, just issuing, saying what the entry point is, because uh, I can actually issue configurations. Like if you, I don't know if it's possible to see, but I'm actually specifying uh, the topics that I want on my Kafka broker inside of the launch command. So not only does it start the container, but it actually issues some configuration. And then most importantly, I think Billy pointed this out earlier, uh, I can create environment variables inside of the container through this, uh, through this configuration, and that's actually how I'm gonna wire everything together. So in my applications, I just expect that when it comes up, um, I'm going to look for certain environment variables in order to know what container to talk to and so forth and so on. Like in my storm topology, um, I just say that the Kafka broker, right, look for the Kafka broker environment variable and, um, connect in that way when the spout comes up. So you can use that to wire it together, of course, right, it's a matter of bringing it together into an interface process. Um, but for the moment, you know, this didn't take very long to put together, especially once you have it templatized. So once we execute this file, we end up with this, right? It brings up all the containers. The HBase containers talk to the same Zookeeper instance, the one that came up specifically for this application. They're able to form a cluster. The Kafka broker comes up, the storm um, uh, the storm uh, supervisors will know where that Kafka broker is because of the environment variables. And so now we have a cohesive environment for us to deploy into. Um, at that point, at the moment, what we actually have to do is have a Docker container that has the process where I give it the GitHub, I tell it what dependencies are gonna get built, um, I tell it where I'm gonna deploy, so I had to build that. Um, Ultimately, you can imagine how, and you could probably implement something this, like this yourself, where it comes up as almost as part of the assembly. Right? Executes, and at that point, uh, I'll point out one other thing. There's a part in the, oh, the quick links aren't here. So there's a, there's a quick links um, portion of the descriptor where um, by using wildcards, like you could see there's one here like cluster name, right, that's what allows us to get to that URL that's gonna get constructed when this container comes up. Um, that quick link will then get published here. So that's what will actually take us to the UI. Um, so at the end, the end result is this. We have all these containers, all these components talking together, ready for the deployed application. The application gets deployed with the Docker container, Storm topology comes up, the NiFi flow comes up, they find these, everything finds itself, starts talking to each other, HBase is there, and if we click on the actual monitor UI, the application comes up. So, just once again, the pieces aren't all completely put together yet, but you could easily see how, with a little bit more work, get to the point where, um, you ask for an assembly, and what you get is a fully running application that addresses a business vertical. So in this case, right, like the, this is a credit fraud app, so um, if you can imagine there's, credit, there, there's transactions coming through, normally there actually be transactions simulated in the interest of time. There's a few on the screen already. This one is identified as false. We can see that it's identified as false because the amount is way out of normal range that this person spends. The analyst takes a look at it, 
and says, oh, you know, there's a lot of transactions happening up in New York. This customer this is shopping in uh, Philadelphia, so, you know, this certainly looks fraudulent. I'm going to lock this account. And that customer actually receives a notification on their phone. And it's a little bit hard to see here. Yeah, the customer gets a notification on their phone. Um, they hit, they respond yes, and that unlocks their account. So a fully running application, essentially at the click of a button. Thank you. All right, we've got about four minutes uh, left, so I'm going to quickly close the loop on how uh, this reflects back to the platform itself. So what we have shown here so far, uh, the slider bits, the Yarn Docker integration, um, the Ambari bits, they're all up there on Apache. Of course, they're not part of any releases. Uh, there are patches available, uh, feature branches, so we're going to uh, you know, come up with a document that people can play with. Um, but in addition to the new use cases, we are also obviously improving today's Yarn itself. So. Uh, there are a bunch of things like, you know, we have support for application priorities. You, you know, there are more advanced scheduling uh, features that we're working on. So you can say, run my Storm application very close to where the storage is, or, you know, for some reason, stay, you know, put my application away from this other guy. Um, and, and, you know, we're kind of short of time, but I want to call out specifically Federation. Uh, our friends at Microsoft have been working on making Yarn, you know, not necessarily infinitely scalable, but scale to uh, 100,000 nodes. Uh, so that was one thing I wanted to call out. Um, to summarize, if you look at look at this entire picture, right? Uh, we had a bunch of uh, applications and frameworks running before. Uh, now the you know the new theme is kind of like Avengers Assemble. So bring your use cases, run them all uh, on a shared uh, cluster. Uh, how do we? It has always been changing. It will continue to change, and uh, we hope to we, we we hope that this is one more massive dent in uh, uh, where this whole ecosystem is going. So we have about three minutes of questions. How is it? Anybody asleep yet? <laughs> okay, so we've got three minutes worth of questions. Fire away. I'll repeat it for the audience. What about long-running services? Yeah, so the question is, what about long-running services? Uh, so implicitly, uh, because of the use cases themselves, uh, assemblies includes regular application, long-running services, and complex applications. So, uh, yeah, it's implicit that we, we have support for services too. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of work here, security, HA, you know, rolling upgrades. You can imagine, I've glossed over a couple of them I want to talk, but uh, that, that's where we're really going. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. So uh, question is capacity school, a question mark. Uh, the answer is, uh, you, all these new use cases simply inherit what Yarn already has. So fair scheduler, capacity scheduler, you know, this policy, that policy, you know, it doesn't matter what container you're running underneath. At the org level, the policies continue to be the same. There's one there and there's one here. I'll just take those two quickly. Uh, is there a mechanism built in for building smoke tests for assemblies? There you go. So those are the kind of things. That, so the uh, question is, is there a mechanism built in to build smoke tests for assemblies? Uh, we haven't gotten to that layer. That's a, that's a very uh, nice idea. So you can imagine building a more complex assembly, which takes the base assembly and the testing infrastructure itself, and makes it a Uber app, which you know, which is self-contained. That, that's a pretty good idea. Well, no, one here. Go ahead. I'll repeat the question for you. updates as though there's sort of a magical thing that happens automatically. Um, that's just, that's not always true. Uh, so where are you guys going in terms of dynamic, dynamically updating DNS and controlling uh, those infrastructure components as you're spinning up and down applications? Yeah, so, uh, so sh short answer is the networking and the DNS bits happen to be one of the complex b pieces here. The challenge really is applications come and, you know, come and go. Uh, so by the time the application actually starts running, we want to create an IP address for each of these containers, get the DNS name. So we are doing a bunch of magic actually in the background. Uh, there, but there are, of course, uh, you have to talk to the, your local IT guy and you know, how does the DNS names map to, you know, uh, the app DNS names map to the corp DNS names, there are a bunch of things there. Again, uh, we'll, we'll share more of this, there's an Apache Jira. There are Apache Jiras for all of them, so I'm gonna share this slide where uh, you can navigate from there. There are a bunch of interesting conversations in the community. Yeah, Roman. The Jiras, uh, 
yeah, you know, with the whole orchestration uh, between these slides, the jiras are there in the uh, on this slide. Where uh, again, I'll, I'll share it out so that the entire world knows. All of this, are, the patches, the you know, feature branches, they're all out there. Uh, isn't this registry? So registry plus DNS is actually part of that whole discovery solution. Yeah. Okay, actually, I think we're out of time. Is, time She'll is kick me now. out. Thanks for attending. <laughs>